Good afternoon and welcome, and thank you for joining us today. And I really look forward to our discussion on ways to get more out of your trade show marketing. My name is Jim Kennedy, and I'm the Senior Director of Marketing for Lands End Business Outfitters. And by the number of people on the call today, it's clear that this is a topic that's important to us as marketers and as business people. And I'm extremely excited this afternoon because we have a special guest joining us from New York. Her name is Ruth Stevens, and she's truly the foremost authority on trade show marketing. As a matter of fact, she's written a book on the topic. So welcome, Ruth. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Thanks. And so before um, before I introduce Ruth a little bit further, let me take the audience through our agenda today. Um, there's kind of two key components of what we're going to talk about. The first is a summary of trade show research that we conducted with our customers in January. We reached out to over 1,200 folks that exhibit at trade shows, and we're going to give you some of their insights, some of their challenges, some of the things that they're trying to get out of trade shows. But more importantly, and the reason we're here today is to learn from Ruth. Um, so Ruth's going to help us with kind of three key areas. The first is setting objectives talk about great boothmanship, and finally, attracting the right visitors to your booth. So let me uh, share a little bit of the research, because this is kind of the foundation of our discussion today. As I mentioned, we reached out and had respondents from over 1,200 uh, decision makers that plan, staff, and exhibit at trade shows. Um, and what they told us is that 89% of them are planning to exhibit in 2013, and maybe more surprisingly, to me anyways, 25% of their total marketing budget is dedicated to trade shows. With, so with that much of our spend um, in trade shows, we've got to be able to get the most out of it. The other thing that we learned, um, and the other thing that they told us, I should say, is that the primary reason for going to shows is lead generation, driving more business to your company. And, and that, I think, is a great segue to introduce Ruth Stevens. Um, more formally to the discussion. Ruth, your background is, is great and um, really fits our topic very well. You're a teacher at Columbia Business School in the MBA program. You've been named 100 Most Influential People by Cranes B2B. You've held senior marketing posts with Time Warner and IBM and others. And, of course, you're an author. So welcome, Ruth, to the discussion. Thanks. Delighted to be here. I actually uh, researched the trade show and event marketing world uh, to prepare this book because the the book on the left because I noticed that a large percentage of B2B marketing budgets were devoted to business events especially trade shows your data suggested 25% that's very consistent with what I I've seen I've, I've seen uh, data from uh the um ex the Center for Exhibition research that had an 18% number, and I've talked to exhibitors who spend as much as 40 or even 50% of their budgets on trade shows. So it's a real, it's an important piece of any B2B marketing program, but it, it's an opportunity to waste money as much as it is to get value. So I, I want to begin with by, by suggesting that it's essential to get your objectives scheduled and, and written down in advance. And um, I, I, again, the, the Center for Exhibition Industry Research had some some data a while back that suggested that most exhibitors are, are just not doing this. And I think it's crazy. If you're spending 18 to 40 percent of your budget in this category, you need to know how to declare success when you see it. So it's essential to put your to identify primary objectives and your your um, respondents Jim said lead generation was their primary objective I, I applaud that uh, business events are a great place to generate leads but I would even make it more specific I would suggest that your listeners also put a dollar number and a and a quantity number around their objective. Make it very tangible. So they might say, we're planning at this trade show to generate 500 leads at $350 per lead or something as, as specific as that. Put it in writing so that, number one, you can sort of keep yourself honest and also explain to management what, what they're going to get for this investment. And also be sure that you've figured out the metrics. I was suggesting $350 and a, a couple of, of um, 
points about quantity, but you also have to be sure that you have the data capture method in place so you, you will be able to capture data that explains whether you met your objective or not. In the case of lead generation, it might be as simple as uh, a tool that allows you to capture some kind of registration after you've had a conversation with a prospect, but it very likely needs to be more sophisticated than just a scanner because that, that uh, data will, will probably not be as, as rich as you need. But, the, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Ruth, one of mm-hmm. the, um, the other things that you're speaking about, mm. kind of capturing the data, the other thing that, that kind of occurs to me is that I think it's also a way to measure the health of the show. Mm. So if there are shows that you go back to year after year, um, you could tell, you know, oftentimes we'll come back from a show and say, hey, it was a great show. But if you have quantitative examples, you can say it was a great show because my leads were up this year versus last year, or it was not as good of a show for us. Our leads were down. What could we do differently? Right. And that's why I like cost per lead as a, a metric because it can apply across multiple media channels. So you could compare when you're planning your budget for the following year, you could say, hey, we got the best cost per lead from trade show, so let's invest more there. Or show X did better than show Y, so let's you know pump up our presence. At, at show X, so it okay. becomes a, a benchmark. Great. Well, let's talk about once we get to the show, uh, yeah. Ruth, mm-hmm. because here's here's an example of a lonely, presumably <laughs> salesperson waiting in their booth, and we want to talk about boothmanship. So let me start with a little bit of research. Um, when we asked our our audience, said what makes for a bad trade show, and as I look at these results, um, it's really about boothmanship. There's examples of staff ignoring you, uh, a large percentage it's a bad show when, the, when they're sloppy or messy or distracted by using their f- cell phones, et cetera. Mm. Um, so it can really make or break how, uh, how attendees uh, perceive you at a show. We also ask who, who staffs the booth. Um, in this, it was, I kind of expected this response. Um, because this is how we might staff a booth, mostly with sales and marketing people. Those are the folks that are representing your company at these shows. Um, so with that set up and that research, Ruth, can you talk to us about great boothmanship? Absolutely. The, this is uh, really the theoretical underpinning of everything around trade shows because the, the reason you spend a relatively high amount compared to other media channels to have a, an interaction with a prospect is that it's a face-to-face interaction, and therefore it's higher quality and also higher expense. So that means that the leverage that is available to you in trade show marketing is heavily around people. It's selecting the right people and training them and, and motivating them to have a series of, of quality conversations. So. Um, so deciding who should man the booth is is a, a first and, a, and very important concept or you know decision that needs to be made. And I would argue that the best booth worker is someone who actually is matched to the audience. So if, for example, everyone on the show floor you know from consulting with the show organizer and looking at the attendee demographics that they will provide the you know, sort of have to do that for you. The You want to make sure that the people in your booth are similar in both status and knowledge and maybe even demographics to the person on the show floor. So if it's a highly technical audience, you know, everyone running around on the show floor is an engineer, then you need to have engineers in your booth. If everyone's a 20-something, then, you know, you don't want to have that many gray hairs in your booth either. So having that kind of uh, demographic and and skill-based and and, um, level-based matchup is is really important. Uh, Now, interestingly, your, your respondents mentioned uh, sales and marketing people as the top categories that from which they select booth workers and and that may be the best solution but actually there's a, a bit of a secret weapon available to most companies that they may not have considered and that is that your call center whether it's a service staffer or an inside sales staffer may be actually the best person to put into your booth because those people have uh, been trained and motivated over time 
to know how to engage and disengage in a series of conversations. And, you know, the typical salesperson, frankly, most field salespeople are really about closing. And so their skills are about a deep, long, productive conversation that is is designed for uh, for closing. And um, that's not what we're trying to do at a show. We're, we're trying to engage, capture data, explain a bit about our uh, our offering, but mostly understand their needs and record the, that information and then let them go so we can move on to the next person because really the, the time available and the skills available uh, to us from the booth um, the, the number of hours at the booth and the, the quality of the staffer, that's our constrained resource that needs to be uh, used to calculate exactly, you know, how many qualified leads we're going to be able to produce. So um, that I, I would just, you know, wrap up with, with that point. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting point, and we at Land's End were known for our customer service experience. It's certainly something that I might even take away as um, something we should be doing because we have that talent pool here with us. You do, <laughs> right. Yeah. So let's, um, Ruth, let's talk about uh, a little bit more about the research, and I think this is going to get us into booth design a little bit. But what is, you know, what is the biggest challenge when staffing a booth? What we found um, is that it's all about kind of the top three, uh, top three data points here. It's about generating traffic. Um, another big challenge is differentiating and identifying those quali qualified leads. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about booth design, and I'll introduce this section by here's a, here's a booth that we utilize for our school uniform business. Um, I'd love to see more people in there <laughs> at this <laughs> point, but maybe maybe it was pre-show, let's hope. I'm um, sure you set it up that way, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the photo that, I mean. Um, Let's uh, let's talk about the booth design and, and a little bit about signage and promotion and how important that is uh, when you're on the show floor. Okay, so actually, could you just go back to the Lands End booth? I I think it, it the, the image. I mean, or here I'll sure. just I'll yeah. just do that. Um, I, I'm really impressed with the, um, the the schoolhouse look that you've created here. It's very eye catching, and the fact that the signage. Um, of Lands End School is visible from quite a distance away, and that is really, really smart. What I do wonder is what was your strategy in having these four risers around the edges? Because what, I, what I'd like to explain uh, about booth design is uh, the concept of, well, of an open booth design versus a closed booth design. And the idea here is that first you determine what you're trying to get done at the show. And if it's lead generation and you're expecting a, most of the people on the show floor to be prospective buyers and to, and to help you, you know, you want to capture their information, have a conversation with them, and then continue to market to them over time, then your ideal booth design is extremely open. So we have a line drawing here that it, it's actually looking down from the top, so it's a little confusing. But the, the point is that the carpet area, which is that rectangle at the bottom, is has no barriers that – uh, as people walk by, they're uh, you know and they have they have a complete access to move their way into the booth. Now this is a bit of a larger kind of booth, and and in a ten by ten operation where only one side of the the booth is is facing the aisle, then the equivalent point would be let's not have any countertops or other furniture. Um, keeping people from coming in and, and having a conversation. And this strategy makes sense when you know that the large majority, say 85, 90% of the people walking by are the people that, that you want to converse with and, and eventually turn into a qualified lead and sell to. Um, and if that's the case, then you want to come up with good reasons for why they should stop by. We'll talk about signage in a minute, but you may want to have some visible tchotchkes there, and, you, and you'll want to have pre-show promotions that are designed to motivate people to, to stop by when, when, and, and have a conversation when they, when they pass your booth. 
Now, the other strategy, known as a closed booth style, you can see this line drawing here. They've actually deliberately built a wall on three sides of the booth, and this is a good strategy when, in, in a couple of contexts. One, when not very many people on the show floor are likely to be buyers, um, and you sort of don't want to waste your time with people who are never going to buy from you, so you you know put up these barriers. The other example is in highly regulated or deeply competitive industries. Uh, this might be in pharma, it might be in fashion, where the the strategy with the booth is to have meetings, um, meetings behind closed doors, maybe to show your wares in a, a, a private one-to-one -one environment to keep your competitors at, at bay. And in that case, then, your your booth design would be to, you know, <laughs> keep people out and attract people strictly through appointment setting in advance. And this is a, a really reasonable uh, strategy in, in the right industry, but it deeply impacts the way you design the booth. So, Bruce, um, yeah, I, go ahead. I, wanna, um, mm. I know you've got an example that I think yeah. is pretty creative because what you're showing here are probably some high build-out costs of these booths, some pretty elaborate builds. But right. um, you've got an example coming up here of a small company who got really creative and I think did a great job. Can you share that with us? Yeah. It, the, the example is from King Industries, which is a, a Connecticut-based specialty chemicals company. This is a, a privately owned company, and trade shows are really their number one lead generation program in their entire marketing strategy. And what – what they want to do at shows is generate leads, and they know that the best quality of a lead for their industry is that someone has requested a sample of the chemical that they can then use in their lab and determine whether the chemical is going to work in their processes. If, it, if they don't request a sample, then they're usually not worth the time of a salesperson. So on the show floor, what, what King does is uh, they try to create an opportunity to motivate prospects to uh, request a sample. And the way they do this is it's really quite nice. They use an old-fashioned paper-based lead form that is designed for each show, set, uh, differently for each show, and allows the booth worker to just check off or circle or otherwise really in a very easy way capture data from uh, the conversation that they're having with a the prospect. They just have to st staple, a, a ca capture a business card and staple it. And these lead forms are then key entered later and, and followed up on appropriately. But you might, you know, so people on, on the, the call today might say, well, you know, they should really be doing this electronically, and they test electronic data capture methods all the time and have concluded that paper-based works for them um, the best. But he here's the, the, the next point that I wanted to make about King Industries that I think you, you really liked, Jim, and th this is the, the notion that sometimes, it, depending on your strategy, and again, these guys are all about lead generation, um, sometimes getting really creative about booth design can can pay off. And in this example, what what King um, decided to do was, it, in the case of an automotive show, and you know, chemical additives are um, a big part of the automotive industry. So that that's a a target audience that's really important to them. They they decided this one year that. They were going to take a 20 by 20 space for the, the lubricant additive division. And instead of a booth, they rented a 1931 Packard. And they just parked it in the middle of a, a piece of carpet. And they put a couple of counters and a couple of old-fashioned signs. You can see the, the sign on the right that says something about King's longstanding love affair with the automobile. And what... And they also, the staffers were all wearing a, a really nice logo T-shirt or polo shirt, the same color as the Packard, and it, it was a beautifully integrated look. And they they um, attracted so many visitors using this booth that not only was the, the Packard uh, rental less than installing their regular booth, 
they were able to increase their normal level of qualified leads by 35% in this automotive, automotive show. So it was a it was a huge success. Yeah, that is so clever, uh, and it's so breakthrough. You know, when you when you think about walking a booth uh, floor, there's just sign after sign, and and a lot of the images and messages coming at you. Boy, what a great way to break through. Right. Right. And while we're on the subject of signage, <laughs> uh, can I just uh, rant about this a little bit? Sure. Because um, this is a, an opportunity for you to both attract the right prospects who are strolling by on the aisles and also repel the prospects who are never going to, to buy f- from you. So the signage needs to to keep both of those concepts in mind. And the, and, and when we think about how signage sort of physically works, it needs to be large enough so that, you know, the way you guys did at that, that um, school show, so that people who are way down the aisle, several uh, uh, booths away, will know why they should stop by or not stop by as they as they stroll toward your booth. So... The, the rule of thumb for how to craft your your signage is to think about the a, a benefit oriented message that's very similar to what you use in email subject lines and direct mail outer envelope teaser copy and these are benefits like new and easy and proven that will allow the prospect to get excited about why he needs to to stop by and, and, and talk to you. And if you can put in some copy that gives them enough information so that they know that your offering is not in their wheelhouse, that's helpful as well because you don't want to waste your booth staffer's time with people who are just never going to buy in your category. So I, I collected a couple of samples in relation to uh, my work on this book, and um, and I have I have them here. This was from a marketing show. You know me; I'm a marketer, so I'm always going to to trade shows uh, uh, designed for marketers. And and um, I I experienced these three signs at at a particular marketing show. So, Jim, let me put you on the spot and ask you which one you think is is most effective, if any. Well, I mean, yeah, in, in looking at them, I'd have to say that what is what I'm drawn to, kind of take the images aside, is, is mm. probably the last one yeah. um, because I'm drawn to the 14 million. Yeah, why, why so is that? So I'm not that? sure if that's what makes it impactful to me or, or not. It is. It is actually one of the key uh, sort of te- techniques that allows a sign to be more trustworthy, more impactful, more alluring is using a number. It's it's amazing. A number communicates tangibility of the of the benefit, and also it it communicates some not, not only tangibility but trustworthiness that you're you're being so specific that it, it sounds authoritative. When when we look at these other two signs, and oh by the way, I would say that we have the best database of 14 million businesses. The the beauty of this is not only is it um, uh, appealing on, on the, the specificity front, but it also will attract only people who really want to know about business data. And so if a consumer marketer is walking by, they're not going to stop because, and you know, presumably we don't want them to stop because it's about, we've told them that we're in the, in the B2B data world here. So that, that will, would support the objective of repelling unqualified prospects and attracting qualified. Now, what do, what do you think about these other two ones, Jim? Um, I, I think they're okay. I mean, I, I probably we've probably uh, done something like this in the past. Well, let me try to steer you away from, okay. uh, from these two strategies. The one in the upper left-hand corner, I would say this is just so buzzwordy and – and sort of pabulum, it doesn't tell me anything about why I should stop and have a conversation. It's, um, you know, it, it, it's a set of three buzzwords that could apply to any business. And it, it doesn't even give me the name of the company, not to mention what they do and, and why I should care. So, 
you know, it, when I saw this, these three words, I, of course, you know, I was doing research, so I went up to them and, and I said, so what do you guys do anyway? And, and I got a really compelling answer from them. They, they said, we're a direct marketing agency. We handle everything from soup to nuts. We do creative. We do database. We have millions of email names for sale. We do production, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, well, why didn't you tell me that in the signage or at least, you know, summarize it and, and attract me to come up and, and learn more about, about your offering? And then the one on the right, this is, this is a great story. You know, when I looked at connecting the E generation, now I'm at a marketing conference, right? I would have hypothesized, gee, maybe, you know, maybe it's a telemarketing shop that sells to the youth market. Or maybe it's an internet service provider or something. Um, but no, it was actually a, a software um, product that allows large enterprises to personalize their communications in, in multiple media. And they, they have customers like Fidelity and Merrill Lynch who, who use their software to create monthly customer statements. And I thought, why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> or, or right. at least give me a clue. Right. Now, yeah. Ruth, what, what I'm going to ask for, um, we're running up against our time. Yeah, um, let's go to our conclusion slide. And I want to let the audience know that this presentation, along with some downloadable tips and tricks that Ruth has put together, will be available after the discussion. And uh, these, these tips that Ruth has put together are going to be fantastic for the audience to take those back to their organizations as they plan for their next show. So let's wrap up with our conclusion, uh, Ruth. Yes, and there are a couple of uh, fresh points that I'd like to make here. The, the first is about staff training, that uh, just spending a bit of money to, once you've determined the booth staff, to train them up about this engage and disengage process can really add leverage to the effectiveness of the booth. And um, the other point is about data capture, that if your staffers are having a conversation with a, a prospect, uh, this is why we're there, then information about that conversation needs to be recorded and made available to the marketing group for follow-up to convert that inquiry or that discussion into a qualified lead and, and handing it off to sales for closure. So that's where the revenue happens and, and is, is essential to success. Right, right. Well, Ruth, some fantastic information uh, today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you. Like, it's a great pleasure. I'd like to uh, I'd like to share my contact information with the audience uh, that you see on the screen, as well as Ruth. So, if if Ruth can help you in any way or help your organization, um, feel free to contact her as well. But I want to thank everybody that joined us today. We hope you found the information valuable and informative. And don't forget, the presentation as well as Ruth's uh, downloadable tips will be available right after the program. So thanks, everybody, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Please stand by.